Hello, Jacqueline. We I have a new rocking chair today. I had it yesterday, but you couldn't see it yesterday because I didn't show it off. My friend Danielle gave it to me. So hopefully I don't make you all motion sick by rocking backwards and forwards. Closer and further from the camera. I'll try to keep still. But if I rock, yeah, it won't just happen. Hello Tyrell. We'll give it about one more minute. And then we will start our final session for Stardust. Accompanied by our friends over here, you can see Arthur Walesley, Duke of Wellington. Here's my dragon over here. It's a bit dusty. And then Sal is over here on the corner, sitting on top of his stuffed bear. I'm not sure this bear has a name except for Bear. He's an old friend. Hello, Helene. Let us commence to begin. Okay, so last session. Hello, Alex. We had um, Tristan had been turned by the second witch, Madame Semele, into a dormouse and put in a cage. And uh, because of the witch queen's curse, Madame Semele cannot see Yvain, the star. Um, so, she, has an un she is unwittingly carrying a second passenger and taking them to the village of Wall. <laughs> All right, uh, recap. Fell asleep. It's just my soothing voice. Um, so that was the most recent thing. Also in our last session, Primus was murdered by the Witch Queen uh, in the Urtsatz Inn she set up in the Mountain Pass. As was the Unicorn was also killed by her. The poor Brevis got killed killed by the unicorn, as did Billy the goat slash innkeeper. And the Witch Queen was going to finish off Tristran and Yvain, but Tristran sort of um, jury-rigged jury the rest of the Babylon candle wax with a lace from his shirt and thrust his hand into the fire. So got away that way and ended up on a cloud, and then got rescued by Captain Alberic. Um, and they Spent a couple of weeks sailing around catching lightning bolts, or maybe just one week, two weeks, I think. And then landed, landed at a port tree, and were making their way towards Wall, about a ten-week journey. And then they bumped into Madame Semele, who cannot see Yvain, uh, and Tristan bargained with her to trade the, the glass flower that he had for safe passage and room and board until until wall um, and madame assembly agreed to do that and agreed not to harm tristan but turned him into a dormouse and has put him in a cage and is planning to turn him back into by what she says anyways back into a human once they reach wall because that way hmm, that way he's not about asking questions and mice eat a lot less than humans. So, they're on their way to Wall. The Witch Queen is on her way to a place called Diggory Dyke to intercept the star and Tristram. Chapter 9, which deals chiefly with the events at Diggory Dyke. Diggory's Dyke. Diggory's Dyke was a deep cut between two chalk downs. High green hills, where a thin layer of green grass and reddish earth covered the chalk, and there was scarcely enough soil for trees. The dike looked, from a distance, like a white chalk gash on a green velvet board. Local legend had it that when the cut was dug, in a day and night, by one diggery, using a spade that had once been a sword blade, before Wayland Smith had melted it down and beaten it out, on his journey into ferry from Wall. 
had it that the cup was dug in a day. That's quite a quite a deal. That diggery must have been something else. There were those who said the sword had once been Flambergé, and that it once was the sword Balmong. But there were none who claimed to know just who Diggory had been, and it might all have been stuff and nonsense. Anyway, the path to Wall went through Diggory's dyke, and any foot traveller or person going by any manner of wheeled vehicle went through the dyke, where the chalk rose on either side of you like thick white walls, and the, down, and the, and the downs rose up above them like green pillows of a giant's bed. Sorry, Alex, that probably doesn't help with the sleepiness either. Apologies for the oath. In the middle of the dike, beside the path, was what appeared at first glance to be little more than a heaped pile of sticks and twigs. A closer inspection would have revealed it to be something in nature part way between a small shed and a large wooden teepee, with a hole in the roof through which grey smoke occasionally could be seen to trickle out. The man in black had been giving the pile of sticks as close an inspection as he could for two days now, from the top of the downs far above. The hut he had established was inhabited by a woman of advanced years. She had no companions and no obvious occupation, apart from that of stopping each and every lone traveller and each conveyance that passed through the dyke and passing the time of day. She seemed harmless enough, but Septimus had not become the only surviving male member of his immediate family by trusting appearances, and this old woman had, he was certain of it, slit Primus's throat. The obligations of revenge demanded a life for a life. They did not specify any way that the life should be taken. Now by temperament, Septimus was one of nature's poisoners. Blades and blows and booby traps were well enough in their way, but a vial of clear liquid, any trace of taste or odor gone when it was admixtured with food, that was Septimus's metier. Unfortunately, the old woman seemed to take no food she did not gather or trap herself and while he contemplated leaving a steaming pie at the door to her house, made of ripe apples and lethal bane berries, he dismissed it soon enough as pra impractical. He pondered rolling a chalk boulder down from the hills above her, dropping it onto her little house, but he could not be certain that he would hit her with it. He wished he was more of a magician. He had some of the locating ability that ran patchily in his family line, and a few minor magics he had learned or stolen over the years, Nothing that would be of use to him now, when he needed to invoke floods or hurricanes or lightning strikes. So Septimus observed his victim to be, as a cat watches a mouse hole, hour after hour, by night and by day. Hello, John Voth. It was past the mid-hour of the night, and was quite moonless and dark, when Septimus finally crept to the door of the House of Sticks, with a firepot in one hand and a book of romantic poetry and a blackbird's nest into which he had placed several fir cones in the other. Hanging from his belt was a club of oak wood, its head studded with brass nails. He listened at the door, and could hear nothing but a rhythmic breathing, and once in a while a sleeping grunt. His eyes were used to the darkness, and the house stood out against the white chalk of the dyke. He crept around to the side of the house, where he could keep the door in sight. First, he tore the pages from the book of poems, and crumpled each poem into a ball or a paper twist, which he pushed into the sticks of the shack's wall at ground level. On top of the poems he placed the fir cones. Next he opened the fire pot, and with his knife he fished a handful of waxed linen scraps from the lid, dipped them into the glowing charcoal of the pot, and when they were burning well, he placed them on the paper twists and the cones, and he blew gently on the flickering yellow flames until the pile caught. He dropped dry twigs from the bird's nest onto the little fire, which crackled in the night and began to blossom and grow. The dry sticks of the wall smoked gently, forcing Septimus to suppress a cough, and then they caught fire and Septimus smiled. Septimus returned to the door of the hut, hefting his wooden club on high, for, he had reasoned, either the hag will burn with her house, in which case my task is done, or she will smell the smoke and wake, affrighted and distracted and she will run from the house, whereupon I shall beat her head with my club, staving it in before she can utter a word, and she will be dead, and I will be revenged. It is a fine plan, said his dead brother Tertius, in the crackling of the dry wood, 
And once he has killed her, he can go on to obtain the power of Stormhold. We shall see, said Primus, and his voice was the wail of a distant night bird. Flames licked at the little or at the little orange house, the little wooden house, and grew and blossomed on its sides with a bright yellow orange flame. No one came to the door of the hut. Soon the place was an inferno, and Septimus was forced to take several steps backward from the intensity of the heat. He smiled widely and triumphantly, and he lowered his club. There came a sharp pain to the heel of his foot. He twisted and saw a small bright-eyed snake, crimson in the fire's glow, with its fangs sunk deep into the back of his leather boot. He flung his club at it, but the little creature pulled back from his heel and looped at great speed away behind one of the white chalk boulders. The pain in his heel began to subside. If there was poison in its bite, thought Septimus, the leather will have taken much of it. I shall bind my leg at the calf, and then I shall remove my boot and make a cross-shaped incision in the place where I was bitten, and I shall suck out the serpent's venom. So thinking, he sat down upon a chalk boulder in the fire's light, and he tugged at his boot. It would not come off. His foot felt numb, and he realized that the foot must be felling, swelling fast. Then I shall cut the boot off, he thought. He raised his foot to the level of his thigh, and for a moment he thought his world was going dark, and then he saw that the flames which had illuminated the dike like a bonfire were gone. He felt chilled to the bone. So, said a voice from behind him, soft as a silken strangling rope, sweet as a poisoned lozenge. You thought that you would warm yourself at the burning of my little cottage. Did you wait at the door to beat out the flames, should they prove not to my liking? Septimus would have answered her, but his jaw muscles were clenched, his teeth gritted hard together. His heart was pounding inside his chest like a small drum, not in its usual steady march, but in a wild, arrhythmic abandon. He could feel every vein and artery in his body threading fire through his frame. If it was not ice that they pumped, he could not tell. An old woman stepped into his view. She looked like the woman who had inhabited the old hut, but older, so much older. Septimus tried to blink, to clear his tearing eyes, but he had forgotten how to blink, and his eyes would not close. You should be ashamed of yourself, said the woman, attempting arson and violence upon the person of a poor old lady living upon her own, who would be entirely at the mercy of every passing vagabond were it not for the kindness of her little friends. And she picked something up from the chalky ground and placed it about her wrist. Then she walked back into the hut, miraculously unburned or restored, Septimus did not know which, and did not care. His heart juddered and syncopated inside his chest, and if he could have screamed, he would. It was dawn before the pain ended, and in six voices, his older brothers welcomed Septimus to their ranks. Septimus looked down one last time on the twisted, still warm form he had once inhabited, and at the expression in its eyes. Then he turned away. There are no brothers left to take revenge on her he said in the voice of the morning curlews, and it is none of us will ever be lord of Stormhold. Let us move on. And after he had said that, there were not even ghosts in that place. Now that's quite a difference from the movies. I think the ghosts are quite funny in the movies. Um, so I, I do like the movie version's interpretation of the ghosts. The sun was high in the sky that day when Madame Semele's caravan came lumbering through the chalk cut of, the, of Diggory's dyke. Madame Semele noticed the soot-blackened wooden hovel beside the road, and as she approached closer, the bent old woman in her faded scarlet dress, who waved at her from beside the path. The woman's hair was white as snow, her skin was wrinkled, and one eye was blind. "'Good day, sister. What happened to your house?' asked Madame Semele. The young people of today, one of them thought it would be good sport to fire the house of a poor old woman who has never harmed a soul. Well, he learned his lesson soon enough. Aye, said Madame Semele, they always learn and are never grateful to us for the lesson. There's truth for you, said the woman in the faded scarlet dress. Now tell me, dear, who rides with you this day? That, said Madame Semele haughtily, is none of you never mind, and I shall thank you to keep yourself to yourself. Who rides with you? 
Tell me truly or I shall set harpies to tear you limb from limb and hang your remains from a hook deep beneath the world. And who would you be to threaten me so? The old woman stared up at Madame Semley with one good eye and one milky eye. I know you ditchwater Sal, none of your damned lip, who travels with you. Madame Semley felt the words being torn from her mouth, whether she would say them or not. There are two mules who pull my caravan, myself, a maid servant I keep in the form of a large bird, and a young man in the form of a dormouse. Anyone else? Anything else? No one and nothing. I swear it upon the sisterhood. The woman at the side of the road pursed her lips. Then get away with you, and get along with you, she said. Madame Semele clucked and shook the reins, and the mules began to amble on. In her borrowed bed in the dark interior of the caravan, the star slept on, unaware how close she had come to her doom, nor by how slim a margin she had escaped it. When they were out of sight of the stick house and the deathly whiteness of Diggory's dyke, the exotic bird flapped up onto its perch, threw back its head and whooped and crowed and sang, until Madame Semele told it that she would wring its foolish neck if it would not be quiet. And even then, in the quiet darkness inside the caravan, the pretty bird chuckled and twittered and trilled, and once it even hooted like a little owl. The sun was already ready was already low in the western sky as they approached the town of Wall. The sun shone in their eyes, half blinding them and turning their world to saffron. The sky, the trees, the bushes, even the path itself was golden in the light of the setting sun. Madame Semele reigned in her mules in the meadow where her stall would be. She unhitched the two mules and led them to the stream where she hitched them to a tree. They drank deeply and eagerly. There were other market folk and visitors setting up their stalls all over the meadow, putting up tents and hanging draperies from trees. There was an air of expectation that touched everyone and everything, like the golden light of the westering sun. Madame Semele went into the inside of the caravan and unhooked the cage from its chain. She carried it out into the meadow and put it down on a hillock of grass. She opened the cage door and picked out the sleeping dormouse with bony fingers. Out you come, she said. The dormouse rubbed its liquid black eyes with its forepaws and blinked at the fading daylight. The witch reached into her apron and produced a glass daffodil. With it she touched Tristan's head. Tristan blinked sleepily and then he yawned. He ran a hand through his unruly brown hair and looked down at the witch with fierce anger in his eyes. Why, you evil old crone, he began. Hush your silly mouth, said Madame Semele sharply. I got you here safely and soundly, and in the same condition I found you in. I gave you board and I gave you lodging, and if neither of them were to your liking or expectation, well, what is it to me? Now be off with you, before I change you into a wiggling worm and bite off your head, if it is not your tail. Go. Shoo, shoo. Tristram counted to ten, and then ungraciously walked away. He stopped a dozen yards away beside a copse, and waited for the star, who limped down the side of the caravan steps and came over to him. Are you all right? he asked, genuinely concerned as she approached. Yes, thank you, said the star. She did not ill-use me. Indeed, I do not believe that she ever knew that I was there at all. Is that not peculiar? Madame Semele had the bird in front of her now. She touched its plumed head with her glass flower, and it flowed and shifted and became a young woman in appearance not too much older than Tristran himself, with dark curling hair and furred cat-like ears. She darted a glance at Tristran, and there was something about those violet eyes that Tristran found utterly familiar, although he could not recall where he had seen them before. So that is the bird's true form, said Yvain, said Yvain. She was a good companion on the road. And then the star realized that the silver chain the bird had worn was still being worn now the bird had become a woman, for it glinted golden red upon her wrist and ankle, and she pointed this out to Tristran. Yes, said Tristran, I can see. It is awful, but I'm not sure there's much that we can do about it. They walked together through the meadow, towards the gap in the wall. We shall visit my present, my parents first, said Tristran, for I have no doubt that they have missed me as I have missed them, although truth to tell, Tristan had scarcely given his parents a second thought on his journeyings, and then we shall pay a visit to Victoria Forester and... 
And it was with this and that Tristan closed his mouth, for he could no longer reconcile his old idea of giving the star to Victoria Forrester with his current notion that the star was not a thing to be passed from hand to hand, but a true person who was in all respects her own woman and no kind of a thing. But Victoria Forrester was the girl he loved. Well and all, he would burn that bridge when he reached it, he decided. And for now, he would take Yvain into the village and deal with events as they came. He felt his spirits lift, and his time as a dormouse had already become nothing more in his head than the remnants of a dream, as if he had merely taken an afternoon nap in front of the kitchen fire, and was now wide awake once more. He could almost taste in his mouth the memory of Mr. Bromios's best ale, although he realized with a guilty start he had forgotten the colour of Victoria Forrester's eyes. The sun was huge and red behind the rooftops of wall when Tristan and Yvain crossed the meadow and looked down on the gap in the wall. The star hesitated. Do you really want this? she asked Tristan, for I have misgivings. Don't be nervous, he said, although it's not surprising that you have nerves. My stomach feels as if I had swallowed a hundred butterflies. You should feel so much better when you are sitting in my mother's parlour Drinking her tea, well, not drinking tea, but there will be tea for you to sip. Why, I swear that for such a guest, and to welcome her boy back home, my mother would break out the best china. And his hand sought hers and gave it a reassuring squeeze. She looked at him and she smiled gently and ruefully. Whither thou goest, she whispered. Hand in hand, the young man and the fallen star approached the gap in the wall. Chapter 10. Stardust. It has occasionally been remarked upon that it is as easy to overlook something large and obvious as it is to overlook something small and niggling, and that the large things one overlooks can often cause problems. Tristan Thorne approached the gap in the wall from the ferry side for the second time since his conception, eighteen years before, with the star limping beside him. His head was in a whirl from the scents and sounds of his native village, and his heart rose within him. He nodded politely to the guards on the gap as he approached, recognizing them both, the young man shifting idly from foot to foot, sipping a pint of what Tristan supposed to be Mr. Bromeo's best ale, was Whiston Pippin, who had once been Tristan's schoolfellow, although never his friend, while the older man, sucking irritably upon a pipe, which appeared to have gone out, was none other than Tristan's former employer at Monday and Brown's, Jerome Ambrose Brown, Esquire. They had the backs to Tristan in vain, and were resolutely facing the village, as if it might be sinful to observe the preparations occurring in the meadow behind them. "'Good evening,' said Tristan politely. "'Whiston, Mr. Brown.' The two men started. Whiston spilled his beer down the front of his jacket. Mr. Brown raised his staff and pointed the end of it at Tristan's chest nervously. Whiston Pippin put down his ale, picked up his staff, and blocked the gap with it. "'Stay where you are,' said Mr. Brown, gesturing with the staff as if Tristran were a wild beast, which might spring at him at any moment. Tristran laughed. Do you not know me? he asked. It is me, Tristran Thorne. But Mr. Brown, who was Tristran knew, the senior of the guards, did not lower his staff. He looked Tristran up and down, from his worn brown boots to his mop of shaggy hair. Then he stared into Tristran's sun-browned face and sniffed, unimpressed. Even if you are that good-for-nothing Thorne, he said, I see no reason to let either of you through. We guard the wall, after all. Tristan blinked. I, too, have guarded the wall, he pointed out. And there are no rules about not letting people through from this direction. Only from the village. Mr. Brown nodded slowly. Then he said, as one talks to an idiot, And, if you are Tristan, Th Tristan Thorne, which I am only conceding for the sake of the argument here, for you look nothing like him, and you talk little enough like him either. In all the years you lived here, how many people came through the wall from the meadow side? Why, none that I ever knew of, said Tristram. Mr. Brown smiled the same smile he had been used to using when he docked Tristram a morning's wages for five minutes' lateness. Exactly, he said. There was no rule against it because it doesn't happen. No one comes through from the lands beyond, not while I'm on duty any road. Now be off with you before I take my stick to your head. Tristan was dumbfounded. If you think I have gone through, well, everything I've gone through, only to be turned away at the last by a self-important, penny-pinching grocer 
and by someone who used to crib for me in history, he began. But Yvain touched his arm and said, Tristan, let it go for now. You shall not fight with your own people. Tristan said nothing. Then he turned without a word, and together they walked back up the slope of the meadow. Around them a hodgepodge of creatures and people erected their stalls, hung their flags, and wheeled their barrows. And it came to Tristan then, in a wave of something that resembled homesickness, but a homesickness comprised in equal parts of longing and despair, that these might as well be his own people, for he felt he had more in common with them than with the pallid folk of wall in their worsted jackets and their hobnailed boots. They stopped and watched a small woman, almost as broad as she was high, do her best to put up her stall. Unasked, Tristran walked over and began to help her, carrying the heavy boxes from her cart to the stall, climbing a tall stepladder to hang an assortment of streamers from a tree branch, unpacking heavy glass carafes and jugs, each one stoppered with a huge blackened cork and sealed with silvery wax and filled with a slowly swirling colored smoke, and placing them on the shelves. As he and the market woman worked, Yvain sat on a nearby tree stump, and she sang to them in her soft, clean voice the songs of the high stars and the commoner songs she had heard and learnt from the folk they had encountered on their journeyings. By the time Tristran and the little woman were done, and the stall was set out for the morrow, they were working by lamplight. The woman insisted on feeding them. Yvain barely managed to convince her that she was not hungry, but Tristran ate everything he was offered with enthusiasm, and unusually for him, he drank the greater part of a carafe of sweet canary wine, insisting that it tasted no stronger than freshly squeezed grape juice, and that it had no effect upon him of any kind. Even so, when the stout little woman offered them the clearing behind her cart to sleep in, Tristan was sleeping drunkenly in moments. It was a clear, cold night. The star sat beside the sleeping man, who had once been her captor, and had become her companion on the road, and she wondered where her hatred had gone. She was not sleepy. There was a rustle in the grass behind her. A dark-haired woman stood behind her, and together they stared down at Tristran. There is something of the Dormouse in him still, said the dark-haired woman. Her ears were pointed and cat-like, and she looked a little older than Tristran himself. Sometimes I wonder if she transforms people into animals, or whether she finds the beast inside us and frees it. Perhaps there is something about me that is by nature a brightly coloured bird. It is something to which I have given much thought, but about which I have come to no conclusions. Tristran muttered something unintelligible, and stirred in his sleep. Then he began gently to snore. The woman walked around Tristran, and sat down beside him. He seems good-hearted, she said. Yes, admitted the star. I suppose that he is. I should warn you, said the woman, that if you leave these lands for over there and she gestured towards the village of Wall with one slim arm, from the wrist of which a silver chain glittered, then you will be, as I understand it, transformed into what you would be in that world, a cold, dead thing, sky-fallen. The star shivered, but she said nothing. Instead, she reached across Tristan's sleeping form to touch the silver chain, which circled the woman's wrist and ankle, and led off into the bushes and beyond. You become used to it in time, said the woman. Do you, really? Violet eyes stared into blue eyes, and then looked away. No. The star let go of the chain. He once caught me with a chain much like yours. Then he freed me, and I ran from him. But he found me and bound me with an obligation, which binds my kind more securely than any chain ever could. An April breeze ran across the meadows, stirring the bushes and the trees, in one long, chilly sigh. The cat-eared woman tossed her curly hair back from her face. You are under a prior obligation, are you not? You have something that does not belong to you, which you must deliver to its rightful owner. The star's lips tightened. Who are you? she asked. I told you. I was the bird in the caravan, said the woman. I know what you are, and I know why the witch woman never knew that you were there. I know who seeks you and why she needs you. Also, I know the provenance of the topaz stone you wear upon a silver chain about your waist. Knowing this, and what manner of thing you are, I know the obligation you must be under. She leaned down, and with delicate fingers she tenderly pushed the hair from Tristan's face. The sleeping youth neither stirred nor responded. I do not think that I believe you or trust you, said the star. A nightbird cried in a tree above them, 
It sounded very lonely in the darkness. I saw the topaz about your waist when I was a bird, said the woman, standing up once more. I watched when you bathed and recognized it for what it was. How? said the star. How did you recognize it? But the dark-haired woman only shook her head and walked back the way that she had come, sparing but one last glance for the sleeping youth upon the grass, and then she was taken by the night. Tristan's hair had obstinately fallen across his face once more. The star leaned down and gently pushed it to one side, letting her fingers dwell upon his cheek as she did so. He slept on. Tristran was woken a little after sunrise by a large badger who snuffled into his ear until Tristran sleepily opened his eyes and then said self-importantly, But in name of Thorn, Tristan of Tristran, of that set? Huh? said Tristran. There was a foul taste in his mouth, which felt dry and furred. He could have slept for another several hours. They've been asking about you, said the badger, down by the gap. Seems there's a young lady wants to have a word with you. Tristan sat up and grinned widely. He touched the sleeping star on her shoulder. She opened her sleepy blue eyes and said, What? Good news, he told her. Do you remember Victoria Forrester? I might have mentioned her name once or twice on our travels. Yes, she said. He might have done. Well, he said, I'm off to see her. She's down by the gap. He paused. Look, well, probably best if you stay here. I wouldn't want to confuse her or anything. The star rolled over and covered her head with her arm and said nothing else. Tristran decided that she must have gone back to sleep. He pulled on his boots, washed his face, and rinsed out his mouth in the meadow stream, and then ran pell-mell through the meadow towards the village. The guards on the wall this morning were the Reverend Miles, the vicar of the wall, and Mr. Bromios, the innkeeper. Standing between them was a young lady with her back turned to the meadow. Victoria, called Tristran in delight, but then the young lady turned, and he saw that it was not Victoria Forrester, who he remembered suddenly, and with delight in the knowing, had grey eyes. That was what they were, grey. How could he ever have allowed himself to forget? Who the young lady in a fine bonnet and shawl could have been, Tristan could not say, but her eyes flooded with tears at the sight of him. Tristan, she said, it is you. They said it was. Oh, Tristan, how could you? Oh, how could you? And he realized who the young lady reproaching him must be. Louisa, he said to his sister, and then, you have certainly grown while I was away, from a chit of a girl into a fine young lady. She sniffed and blew her nose into a lace-edged linen handkerchief, which she pulled from her sleeve. And you, she told him, dabbing at her cheeks with the handkerchief, have turned into a mop-haired, raggle-taggle gypsy on your journeyings, but I suppose you look well, and that is a good thing. Come on now, and she motioned impatiently for him to walk through the gap in the wall and come to her. But the wall, he said, eyeing the innkeeper and the vicar a little nervously. Oh, as to that, when Miss Whitston and Mr. Brown finished their shift last night, they repaired to the saloon, saloon bar at the Seventh Pie, where Whitston happened to mention their meeting with a ragamuffin who claimed to be you, and how they blocked his way, your way. When news of this reached father's ears, he marched right up to the pie and gave both of them such a tongue-lashing and telling off of, telling of what for that I could scarcely believe it was him. Some of us were for letting you come, were for you letting come back this morning," said the vicar, "and some of us were for keeping you there until midday. But none of the ones who are for making you wait are on wall duty this morning," said Mister Bromios, "which took a certain amount of jiggery pokery to organize, and on a day when I should have been seen to the refreshment stand, I could point out. Still, it's good to see you back. Come on through." And with that he stuck out his hand, and Tristran shook it with enthusiasm. Then Tristran shook the vicar's hand. Tristran, said the vicar, I suppose that you must have seen many strange sights upon your travels. Tristran reflected for a moment. I suppose I must have, he said. You must come to the vicarage then next week, said the vicar. We shall have tea, and you must tell me all about it, once you're settled in, eh? And Tristran, who had always held the vicar in some awe, could do nothing but nod. Louisa sighed a little theatrically and began to walk briskly in the direction of the seventh magpie. Tristran ran along the cobbles to catch her up, and then he was walking beside her. It does my heart good to see you again, my sister, he said. As if we were not all worried sick about you, she said crossly, 
what with all your gallivantings, and you didn't even wake me up to say goodbye. Father has been quite distracted with concern for you, and at Christmas, when you were not there after we'd eaten the goose and the pudding, Father took out the port and he toasted absent friends, and Mother sobbed like a babe, so of course I cried too, and then Father began to blow his nose into his best handkerchief, and Grandmother and Grandfather Hempstock insisted upon pulling the Christmas crackers and reading the jolly mottos, and somehow that only made matters worse. And to put it bluntly, Tristan, you quite spoiled our Christmas. Sorry, said Tristan. What are we doing now? Where are we going? We're going to the seventh pie, said Louisa. I should have thought that was obvious. Mr. Bromeo said that you could use his sitting room, somebody who needs to talk to you. And she said nothing more as they went into the pub. There were a number of faces Tristan recognized, and the people nodded at him or smiled or did not smile, as he walked through the crowds and made his way up the narrow stairs behind the bar to the landing with Louisa by his side. The wooden boards creaked beneath their feet. Louisa glared at Tristan, and then her lip trembled, and to Tristan's surprise, she threw her arms about him and hugged him so tightly that he could not breathe. Then, with not another word, she fled down the wooden stairs. He knocked at the door to the sitting room and went in. The room was decorated with a number of unusual objects, of small items of antique statuary and clay pots. Upon the wall hung a stick wound about with ivy leaves, or rather with a dark metal cunningly beaten to resemble ivy. Apart from the decorations, the room could have been the sitting room of any busy bachelor with little time for sitting. It was furnished with a small chaise longue, chaise longue a low table upon which was a well-thumbed leather-bound copy of the Sermons of Lawrence Stern, a pianoforte, and several leather armchairs. And it was in one of these armchairs that Victoria Forrester was sitting. Tristan walked over to her slowly and steadily, and then he went down upon one knee in front of her, as he had once gone down on his knees before her in the mud of a country lane. Oh, please don't, said Victoria Forrester uncomfortably. Please get up. Why don't you sit down over there, in that chair? Yes, that's better. The morning light shone through the high lace curtains and caught her chestnut hair from behind, framing her face in gold. Look at you, she said. You became a man. And your hand, what, what happened to your hand? I burnt it, he said, in a fire. She said nothing in response at first. She just looked at him. Then she sat back in the armchair and looked ahead of her at the stick on the wall, or one of Mr. Bromios's quaint old statues, perhaps. And she said, There are a number of things I must say, Tristram, and none of them will be easy. I would appreciate it if you said nothing until I've had a chance to say my piece. So firstly, and perhaps most importantly, I must apologize to you. It was my foolishness, my idiocy, that sent you off on your journeyings. I thought you were joking. No, not joking. I thought that you were too much a coward, too much of a boy, ever to follow up on any of your fine, silly words. It was only when you had gone and the days passed and you did not return that I realized that you had been in earnest, and by then it was much too late. I have had to live each day with the possibility that I had sent you to your death. She stared ahead of herself as she spoke, and Tristan had the feeling which became a certainty that in his absence she had conducted this conversation in her head a hundred times. It was why he could not be permitted to say anything. This was hard enough on Victoria Forrester, and she would not be able to manage it if he caused her to depart from her script. And I did not play you fair, my poor shop boy, but you are no longer a shop boy, are you? Since I thought that your quest was just foolishness in every way... She paused, and her hands gripped the wooden arms of the chair, grasping them so tightly her knuckles first reddened, then went white. Went white. Ask me why I would not kiss you that night, Tristram Thorne. It was your right not to kiss me, said Tristram. I did not come here to make you sad, Vicky. I did not find you your star to make you miserable. Her head tipped to one side. So you did find the star we saw that night? Oh, yes, said Tristram. The star is back in the meadow, though, right now but I did what you asked me to do. Then do something else for me now. Ask me why I would not kiss you that night. I had kissed you before when you were younger, after all. Very well, Vicky. Why would you not kiss me that night? Because, she said, and there was relief in her voice as she said it, enormous relief, as if it were escaping from her. The day before we saw the shooting star, Robert had asked me to marry him. That evening when I saw you, I had gone to the shop 
hoping to see him and to talk to him and to tell him that I accepted and he should ask my father for my hand. Robert? asked Tristan, his head all in a whirl. Robert Munday. You worked in his shop. Mr. Munday? echoed Tristan. You and Mr. Munday? Exactly. She was looking at him now. And then you had to take me seriously and run off to bring me back a star. And not a day would go by when I did not feel as if I had done something foolish and bad, for I promised you my hand if you returned with the star. And there were some days, Tristan, when I honestly do not know which I thought worse, that you would be killed in the lands beyond, all for the love of me, or that you would succeed in your madness and return with the star to claim me as your bride. Now, of course, some folks hereabouts told me not to take on so, and that it was inevitable that you would have gone off to the lands beyond, of, of course, it being your nature, and you being from there in the first place. But somehow in my heart I knew I was at fault, and that one day you would return to claim me. And you love Mr. Monday, said Tristan, seizing on the only thing in all this that he was certain he had understood. She nodded and raised her head, so her pretty chin pointed towards Tristan. But I give you my word, Tristan. I gave you my word, Tristan, and I will keep my word, and I have told Robert this. I am responsible for all you have gone through, even for your poor burned hand, and if you want me, then I am yours. To be honest, he said, I think that I am responsible for all that I have done, not you. And it is hard to regret a moment of it, although I missed soft beds from time to time, and I shall never be able to look at another dormouse in quite the same way ever again. But you did not promise me your hand if I came back with the star, Vicky. I didn't? No. You promised me anything I desired. The Victoria Forester sat bolt upright then and looked down at the floor. A red spot burned in each pale cheek, as if she had been slapped. Do I understand you to be... She began, but Tristran interrupted her. No, he said. I don't think you do, actually. You said you would give me whatever I desire. Yes. Then, he paused, Then I desire that you should marry Mr. Monday. I desire that you should be married as soon as possible. Why, within this very week, if such a thing could be arranged. And I desire that you should be as happy together as ever a man and woman have ever been. She exhaled in one low, shuddering breath of release. Then she looked at him. Do you mean it? she asked. Marry him with my blessing, and we'll be quits and done, said Tristram, and the star will probably think so too. There was a knock at the door. Is all well in there? called a man's voice. Everything is very well, said Victoria. Please come in, Robert. You remember Tristram Thorne, do you not? Good morning, Mr. Monday, said Tristram, and he shook Mr. Monday's hand, which was sweaty and damp. I understand that you are to be married soon. Permit me to tender my congratulations. Mr. Monday grinned as if he had the toothache. Then he held out a hand for Victoria, and she rose from the chair. If you wish to see the star, Miss Forrester, said Tristan, but Victoria shook her head. I am delighted that you came home safely, Mr. Thorne. I trust that I shall see you at our wedding. I am sure that nothing could give me greater pleasure, said Tristan, although he was sure of no such thing. On a normal day, it would have been unheard of for the seventh magpie to have been so crowded before breakfast. But this was market day, and the wall folk and the strangers were crowded into the bar, eating heaped plates of lamb chops and bacon and mushrooms, and fried eggs and black pudding. Dunstan Thorne was waiting for Tristran in the bar. He stood up when he saw him, walked over and clasped him on the shoulder without speaking. So you made it back without hurt, he said, and there was pride in his voice. Tristran wondered if he had grown while he was away. He remembered his father as a bigger man. Hello, father, he said. I hurt my hand a bit. Your mother has breakfast waiting for you back at the farm, said Dunstan. Breakfast would be wonderful, admitted Tristram, and seeing mother again, of course. Also, we need to talk, for his mind was still on something that Victoria Forrester had said. You look taller, said his father, and you are in badly, badly in need of a trip to the barber's. He drained his tankard, and together they left the seventh magpie and walked out into the morning. The two thorns climbed over a stile into one of Dunstan's fields, and as they walked through the meadow in which he had played as a boy, Tristran raised the matter that had been vexing him, which was the question of his birth. His father answered him as honestly as he was able to during the long walk back to the farmhouse, telling his tale as if he were recounting a story that had happened to someone else, 
a love story. And then they were at Tristram's old home, where his sister waited for him, and there was a steaming breakfast on the stove, and on the table, prepared for him lovingly by the woman he had always believed to be his mother. Madame Semeline adjusted the last of the crystal flowers on the stall, and eyed the market with disfavor. It was a little past noon, and the customers had just started to wander through. None of them had yet stopped at her stall. Fewer and fewer of them every nine year, she said. Mark my words, soon enough this market will be just a memory. There's other markets and other market places I'm thinking. This market's time is almost over. Another forty, fifty, sixty years at the most, and it will be done for good. Perhaps, said her violet-eyed servant, but it does not matter to me. This is the last of these markets I shall ever attend. Madame Semele glared at her. I thought I had long since beaten all of your insolence out of you. It is not insolence, said her slave. Look. She held up the silver chain which bound her. It glinted in the sunlight, but still it was thinner, more translucent than ever it had been before. In places it seemed as if it were made not of silver, but of smoke. What have you done? Spittle flecked the woman's lips. I have done nothing, nothing that I did not do eighteen years ago. I was bound to you to be your slave until the day that the moon lost her daughter, if it occurred in a week when two Mondays came together, and my time with you is almost done. It was gone three in the afternoon. The stars sat upon the meadow grass beside Mr. Bromios's wine and ale and food stall, and stared across at the gap in the wall and the village beyond it. Upon occasion, the patrons of the stall would offer her wine or ale, or great greasy sausages, and always she would decline. "'Are you waiting for someone, my dear?' asked a pleasant-featured young woman, as the afternoon dragged on. "'I do not know,' said the star. "'Perhaps. A young man, if I do not mis—' oh. "'A young man, if I do not mistake my guess, a lovely thing like you.' The star nodded. "'In a way.' she said. I'm Victoria, said the young woman. Victoria Forrester. I'm called Yvain, said the star. She looked Victoria Forrester up and down and up again. So, you are Victoria Forrester. Your fame precedes you. The wedding, you mean, said Victoria, and her eyes shone with pride and delight. A, a wedding, is it? said, asked Yvain. One hand crept to her waist and felt the topaz upon its silver chain. Then she stared at the gap in the wall and bit her lip. "'Oh, you poor thing! What a beast he must be to keep you waiting so!' said Victoria Forrester. "'Why do you not go through and look for him?' "'Because,' said the star, and then she stopped. "'Aye,' she said, "'perhaps I shall.' The sky above them was striped with grey and white bands of cloud, through which patches of blue could be seen. I wish my mother were out, said the star. I would say good-bye to her first. And awkwardly she got to her feet. But Victoria was not willing to let her new friend go that easily, and she was prattling on about bans and marriage licenses and special licenses which could only be issued by archbishops, and how lucky she was that Robert knew the archbishop. The wedding, it seemed, was set for six days' time at midday. Then Victoria called over a respectable gentleman, graying at the temples, who was smoking a black cheroot, and who grinned as if he had the toothache. And this is Robert, she said. Robert, this this is Yvain. She's waiting for her young man. Yvain, this is Robert Monday, and on Friday next at midday, I shall be Victoria Monday. Perhaps you could make something of that, my dear, in your speech at the wedding, breakfast, that on Friday there will be two Mondays together. And Mr. Monday puffed on his cheroot, and told his bride-to-be that he would certainly consider it. Then, asked Yvain, picking her words with care. You are not marrying Tristan Thorne. Certainly not, said Victoria. Oh, said the star. Good. And she sat down again. She was still sitting there when Tristan came back through the gap in the wall several hours later. <sighs> Pardon me, allergy break here. Several hours later, he looked distracted, but brightened up when he saw her. Hello, you, he said, helping her to her feet. Have a good time waiting for me? Not particularly, 
she said. I'm sorry, said Tristram. I suppose I should have taken you with me into the village. No, said the star. You shouldn't have. I live as long as I am in fairy. Were I to travel to your world, I would be nothing but a cold iron stone, pitted and pocked and fallen from the heavens. But I would have taken you through with me. I tried to last night. Yes, she said, which only goes to prove that you are indeed a ninny, a lackwit, and, and, and a clodpole. Dunderhead, suggested Tristram. You always used to like calling me a dunderhead and an oaf. Well, she said, you are all those things and more besides. Why did you keep me waiting like that? I, saw, I thought something terrible had happened to you. I'm sorry, he told her. I won't leave you again. No, she said, seriously and with certainty. You will not. His hound found hers then. They walked hand in hand through the market. A wind began to come up then, flapping and gusting in the canvas of the tents and the flags, and a cold rain spat down upon them. They took refuge under the awning of a bookstall, along with a number of other people and creatures. The stallholder hauled a box full of books further under the canvas to ensure that it did not get wet. Hmm. Oh, what was his voice? I can't remember. He gets whatever voice he gets. Mackerel sky, mackerel sky, not a long wet, nor, long dr nor not long dry, said a man in a black silk top hat to Tristan in the vein. He was purchasing a small book bound in red leather from the bookseller. Tristan smiled and nodded, and as it became apparent that the rain was easing up, he and Evain walked on. Which is all the thanks I shall ever get from them, I'll wager, said the tall man in the top hat to the bookseller, who had not the slightest idea what he was speaking about and did not care. I have said my goodbyes to my family, said Tristan to the star as they walked, to my father and my mother, my father's wife, perhaps I should say, and to my sister, Louisa. I don't think I shall be going back again. Now we just need to solve the problem of how to put you back up again in the sky. Perhaps I shall come with you. You would not like it up in the sky, the star assured him. So I take it you will not be marrying Victoria Forrester. Tristan nodded. No, he said. I met her, said the star. Did you know that she was with child? What? asked Tristan, shocked and surprised. I doubt that she knows. She is one, perhaps two moons along. Good Lord, how did you find out? It was the star's turn to shrug. You know, she said, I was happy to discover that you were not marrying Victoria Forrester. So was I, he confessed. The rain began once more, but they made no move to get under cover. He squeezed her hand in his. You know, she said, a star and a mortal man. Only half mortal, actually, said Tristran helpfully. Everything I've ever thought about myself, who I was, what I am, was a lie, or sort of. You have no idea how astonishingly liberating that feels. Whatever you are, she said, I just want to point out that we can probably never have children. That's all. Tristran looked at the star then, and he began to smile, and he said nothing at all. His hands were on her upper arms. He was standing in front of her and looking down at her. Just so you know, that's all, said the star, and she leaned forward. They kissed for the first time then in the cold spring rain, and neither of them knew that it was raining. Tristran's heart pounded in his chest, as if it was not big enough to contain all the joy that it held, and he opened his eyes as he kissed the star. Her sky-blue eyes stared back into his, and in her eyes he could see no parting from her. The silver chain was now nothing but smoke and vapor, for a heartbeat it hung on the air, then a sharp gust of wind and rain blew it out into nothing at all. There, said the woman with the dark curling hair, stretching like a cat and smiling, the terms of my servitude are fulfilled, and now you and I are done with each other. The old woman looked at her helplessly. But what shall I do? I'm, I'm old. I, I cannot manage this all by myself. You're an evil, foolish slattern, so to desert me like this. Your problems are of no concern to me, said her former slave, but I shall never again be called a slattern or a slave or anything else that is not my own name. I am Lady Una, first-born and only daughter of the 81st Lord of Stormhold, and the spells and terms you bound me with are over and done. Now you will apologize to me, and you will call me by my right name, or I will, 
with enormous pleasure devote the rest of my life to hunting you down and destroying everything that you care for and everything that you are. They looked at each other then, and it was the old woman who looked away first. Then I must apologize for having called you a slattern, Lady Una, she said, as if each word of it were bitter sawdust that she spat from her mouth. Lady Una nodded. Good, and I believe that you owe me payment for my services. Now my time with you is done, she said, for these things have their rules. All things have their rules. The rain was still falling in gusts, and then not falling for just long enough to lure people out from underneath their makeshift shelters, and then raining on them once more. Tristan and Yvain sat, damp, damp and happy, beside a campfire, in the company of a motley assortment of creatures and people. Tristan had asked if any of them knew the little hairy man he had met upon his travels, and had described him as well as he could. Several people acknowledged that they had met him in the past, although none had seen him at the market. He found his hands twining, almost of their own volition, into the star's wet hair. He wondered how it could have taken him so long to realize how much he cared for her, and he told her so, and she called him an idiot, and he declared that it was the finest thing that ever a man had been called. So where are we going to go once the market is done? Tristan asked the star. I do not know, she said, but I have one obligation still to discharge. You do? Yes, she said. The thing I showed you, I have to give it to the right person. The last time the right person came along, that innkeeper woman cut his throat, so I have it still. But I wish it were gone. A woman's voice at his shoulder said, Ask her, what, ask her for what she carries, Tristan Thorne. He turned and stared into the eyes the colour of meadow violets. You were the bird in the witch's caravan, he told the woman. When you were the dormouse, my son, said the woman, I was. But now I have my own form again, and my time of servitude is over. Ask Yvain for what she carries. You have the right. He turned back to the star. Yvain? She nodded, waiting. Yvain, will you give me what you are carrying? She looked puzzled. Then she reached inside her robe, fumbled discreetly, and produced a large topaz stone on a broken silver chain. It was your grandfather's, said the woman. You are the last male of the line of Stormhold. Put it about your neck. Tristran did so. As he touched the ends of the silver chain together, they knit and mended as if they had never been broken. It's very nice, said Tristran dubiously. It is the power of Stormhold, said his mother. There's no one can argue with that. You are of the blood, and all of your uncles are dead and gone. You will make a fine lord of Stormhold. Tristran stared at her in honest puzzlement. But I have no wish to be a lord of anywhere, he told her, or of anything except perhaps my lady's heart. And he took the star's hand in his, and he pressed it to his breast and smiled. All right, give me a moment here. Uh, we are just about to run out of time on Instagram, so I'm going to stop my Instagram stream for the five of you that are on there right now. So tune right back in. I'm going to stop it, restart it. I will put on some old music for those of you who are on Facebook. So just give me a moment here. All right, we've got some music going in the background there. Okay, we're back on on Instagram. We'll just give it a moment for people to rejoin, and then we will finish. Welcome back, Jacqueline. All right. Well, we're doing it. Page two hundred six. Welcome back, Haley.
All right, welcome back, Alex. Welcome back, Tyrell. Give it like another 10 seconds. All right, time to finish our story. The woman flicked her ears impatiently. And in almost 18 years, Tristan Thorne, I have not demanded one single thing of you. And now, the first simple little request that I make, the tiniest favour that I ask of you, you say me no. Now I ask of you, Tristram, is that any way to treat your mother? No, mother, said Tristram. Well, she continued, slightly mollified, and I think it would do you young people good to have a home of your own, and for you to have an occupation. And if it does not suit you, you may leave, you know. There is no silver chain that will be holding you to the throne of Stormhold. And Tristram found this quite reassuring. Yvain was less impressed with it, for she knew that silver chains come in all shapes and sizes, but she knew also that it would not be wise to begin her life with Tristram by arguing with his mother. Maybe they're asleep. Possible. Might I have the honour of knowing what you are called? asked Yvain, wondering if she was laying it on a bit thickly. Tristran's mother preened, and Yvain knew that she was not. I am the Lady Una of Stormhold, she said, and then she reached into a small bag which hung from her side and produced a rose made of glass, of a red so dark that it was almost black in the flickering firelight. It was my payment, she said, for more than sixty years of servitude. It galled her to give it to me, but rules are rules, and she would have lost her magic and more if she had not given it to me. Now I plan to barter it for a palanquin to take us back to the Stormhold. We must arrive in style. Oh, I have missed the Stormhold so badly. We must have bearers and outriders and perhaps an elephant. They are so imposing. Nothing says, get out of the way, quite like an elephant in the front. No, said Tristram. No, said his mother. No, replied Tristram. You may travel by palanquin and elephant and camel and all that if you wish to, mother. But Yvain and I will make our own way there and travel at our own speed. The Lady Una took a deep breath, and Yvain decided that this argument was one she would rather be somewhere else for. So she stood up and told them that she would be back soon, that she needed a walk and not to go wandering too far. Tristan looked at her with pleading eyes, but Yvain shook her head. This was his fight to win, and he would fight it better if she were not there. She limped through the darkening market, pausing beside a tent from which music and applause could be heard, and from which light spilled like liquid gold. She listened to the music, and thought her own thoughts. It was there that a bent, white-haired old woman, glaucous blind in one eye, hobbled over to the star and bade her to stop a while and talk. About what? asked the star. The old woman, shrunken by age and time to little bigger than a child, held on to a stick as tall and bent as herself, with palsied and swollen knuckled hands. She stared up at the star with her good eye and her blue milk eye, and she said, I came to fetch your heart back with me. Is that so? asked the star. Aye, said the old woman. I nearly had it, at that, up in the mountain pass. She cackled at the back of her throat, at the memory. Do you remember? She had a large pack on her back that sat like a hump. A spiral ivory horn protruded from the pack, and Yvain knew where she had seen that horn before. That was you? asked the star of the tiny woman. You with the knives? Hmm, that was me, but I squandered away all the youth I took for the journey. Every act of magic lost me a little of the youth I wore, and now I am older than I have ever been. If you touch me, said the star, lay but a finger on me, you will regret it forevermore. If you ever get to be my age, said the old woman, you will know all there is to know about regrets, and you will know that one more here or there will make no difference in the long run. She snuffled the air. Her dress had once been red, but it seemed to have been much patched and taken up and faded over the years. It hung down from one shoulder, exposing a puckered scar, that might have been many hundreds of years old. So what I want to know is why it is 
that I can no longer find you in my mind. You are still there, just, but there like a ghost, a widow of the wisp. Not, not long ago you burned. Your heart burned in my mind like silver fire. But after that night in the inn it became patchy and dim, and now it is not there at all. Yvain realized that she felt nothing but pity for the creature who had wanted her dead. So she said, Could it be that the heart you seek is no longer my own? The old woman coughed. <coughs> her whole frame shook and spasmed with the wretching effort of it. Star waited for her to, the star waited for her to be done, and then she said, I have given my heart to another. The boy, the one in the inn, with the unicorn? Yes. You should have let me take it back then, for my sisters and me. We could have been young again, well into the next age of the world. Your boy will break it, or waste it, or lose it. They all do. Nonetheless, said the star, he has my heart. I hope that your sisters will not be too hard on you when you return to them without it. It was then that Tristram walked across to Yvain, and took her hand and nodded politely to the old woman. All sorted out, he said. Nothing to worry about. And the palanquin? Oh, Mother will be travelling by palanquin. I had to promise that we'd get to the Stormhold sooner or later, but we can take our time on the way. I think we should buy a couple of horses and see the sights. And your mother acceded to this? In the end, he said blithely. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. We are almost done, said Yvain, and she turned back to the little old woman. My sisters will be harsh but cruel, said the old witch queen. However, I appreciate the sentiment. You have a good heart, child. A pity it will not be mine. The star leaned down then and kissed the old woman on her wizened cheek, feeling the rough hairs of it scrape her soft lips. Then the star and her true love walked away toward the wall. Who was the old biddy? asked Tristan. She seemed a bit familiar. Was anything wrong? Nothing was wrong, she told him. She was just someone I knew from the road. Behind them were the lights of the market, the lanterns and candles and witch lights and fairy glitter, like a dream of the night sky brought down to earth. In front of them across the meadow, on the other side of the gap in the wall, now guardless, was the town of Wall. Oil lamps and gas lamps and candles glowed in the windows of the house of the house of the houses of the village. To Tristran, then, they seemed as distant and unknowable as the world of the Arabian Nights. He looked upon the lights of Wall for what it came to him then with certainty he knew was the last time. He stared at them for some time and said nothing, the fallen star by his side, and then he turned away, and together they began to walk toward the east. Epilogue, in which several endings can be discerned. It was considered by many to be one of the greatest days in the history of Stormhold, the day that the Lady Una, long lost and believed to be dead, having been stolen as an infant by a witch, returned to the Mountain Kingdom. There were celebrations and fireworks and rejoicings, official and otherwise, for weeks after her palanquin arrived in a procession led by three elephants. The joy of the inhabitants of the Stormhold and all its dominions was raised to levels hitherto unparalleled, when the Lady Una announced that, in her time away, she had given birth to a son, who in the absence and presumed death of the last two of her brothers, was the next heir to the throne. Indeed, she told them, he already wore the power of Stormhold about his neck. He and his new bride would come to them soon. The Lady Una could be no more specific about the date of their arrival than this, which appeared to irk her. In the meantime, and in their absence, the Lady Una announced that she would rule the Stormhold as regent, which she did and did well, and the dominions on and about Mount Hewen prospered and flourished under her command. It was three more years before the two travel-stained wanderers arrived, dusty and footsore, in the, in the town of Clouds Range, in the lower reaches of the Stormhold proper, and they took a room in an inn and sent for hot water and a tin bath. They stayed at the inn for several days, conversing with the other customers and guests. On the last day of their stay, the woman, whose hair was so fair it was almost white, and who walked with a limp, looked at the man and said, Well? Well, he said, 
Mother certainly seems to be doing an excellent job of reigning. Just as you, she told him tartly, would do every bit as well if you took the throne. Perhaps, he admitted, and it certainly seems like it would be a nice place to end up eventually, but there are so many places we have not yet seen, so many people still to meet, not to mention all the wrongs to right, villains to vanquish, sights to see, all that, you know. She smiled wryly. Well, she said, at least we shall not be bored, but we had better leave your mother a note. And so it was that the Lady Una of Stormhold was brought a sheet of paper by an innkeeper's lad. The sheet was sealed with sealing wax, and the Lady Una questioned the boy closely about the travellers, a man and his wife, before she broke the seal and read the letter. It was addressed to her, and after the salutations it read, Have been unavoidably detained by the world. Expect us when you see us. Tristram. It was signed by Tristram, and beside his signature was a fingerprint, which glittered and glimmered and shone when the shadows touched it, as if it had been, dust had been, as if it had been dusted with tiny stars. With which, there being nothing else that she could do about it, Una had to content herself. It was another five years after that before the two travellers returned to the mountain fastness. They were dusty and tired and dressed in rags and tatters, and were at first, and to the shame of the entire kingdom, treated as vagabonds and rogues, and it was not until the man displayed the topaz stone that hung about his neck that he was recognized as the Lady Una's only son. The investiture and subsequent celebrations went on for almost a month, after which the young 82nd Lord of Stormhold got on with the business of ruling. He made as few decisions as possible, but those he made were wise ones, even if the wisdom was not always apparent at the time. He was valiant in battle, though his left hand was scarred and of little use, and a cunning strategist. He led his people to victory against the northern goblins when they closed the passes to travelers. He forged a lasting peace with the eagles of the high crags, a peace that remains in place to this day. His wife, the Lady of Ain, was a fair woman from distant parts, although no one was ever entirely certain which ones. She took herself a suite of rooms in one of the highest peaks of the citadel, a suite that had long been abandoned as unusable by the palace and its staff. Its roof had collapsed in a rockfall a thousand years earlier. No one had wished to use them, for the rooms were open to the sky, and the stars and moon shone down upon them so brightly through the thin mountain air that it seemed one could simply reach out and hold them in one's hand. Tristran and Yvain were happy together. Not forever after, for time the thief eventually takes all things into his dusty storehouse, but they were happy, as these things go, for a long while. And then death came in the night and whispered his secret into the ear of the 82nd Lord of Stormhold. And he nodded his grey head and he said nothing more, and his people took his remains to the Hall of Ancestors where they lie to this day. After Tristram's death, there were those who claimed that he was a member of the Fellowship of the Castle and was instrumental in breaking the power of the unseelie court. But the truth of that, as so much, died with him and has never been established one way or the other. Yvain became the Lady of Stormhold and proved a better monarch in peace and in war than any would have dared to hope. She did not age as her husband had aged, and her eyes remained blue, her hair as golden white, and, as the free citizens of the Stormhold would have occasional cause to discover, her temper as quick to flare as on the night that Tristram first encountered her in the glade beside the pool. She walks with a limp to this day, although no one in the Stormhold would ever remark upon it, any more than they dare remark upon the way she glitters and shines upon occasion in the darkness. They say that each night, when the duties of state permit, she climbs on foot and limps alone to the highest peak of the palace, where she stands for hour after hour, seeming not to notice the cold peak winds. She says nothing at all, but simply stares upward into the dark sky, and watches with sad eyes the slow dance of the infinite stars. Now, in the movie... I prefer the movie ending because I find this one a little sad. Um, some people prefer it because it's more realistic. But if you haven't seen the movie, in the movie, the ending, um, Tristan and Yvain both find a way to return to the stars. And uh, because Tristan has possession, as it were, of a, the heart of a star, 
he is also immortal. So they do get their happily ever after. And I'm a happily ever after kind of person, so that is the ending I prefer. You are welcome to choose whichever one you prefer. Thank you for tuning in. I'm taking a break tomorrow, and uh, Saturday as well is my usual break. We will start a new book on Sunday evening. Um, so, let me know if you have thoughts about what book you would like. I'm leaning towards Anne of the Island because there was a certain amount of, there was a swell of popular support for that. But if you have other books you would like me to read, uh, if you can find a way, if I have them, great, I will consider that. If I don't have them and you can get them to me, if I don't have them and you can get them to me, I will also consider that. Um, so, think about it. Think about what you'd like to hear next. We'll continue on Sunday. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you Sunday evening. I do not know what's next yet. Pirates. The movie did have funnier parts, yes. I really liked Captain Shakespeare in, in the movie.